Assalamu alaikum. So our group consisted of myself, Abdullah Ahmed, Talha Ahmed, and Faraz Abdullah worked on uh, the, the detection of PVCs and VTs and ECG signals. And um, so in f the first task, we were simply told to plot um, the respective ECG signals that we were given. Uh, so we essentially loaded the given ECG signals, initialized them into arrays, and then initialized some time arrays and then plotted them and made any observations we could about any region that we could detect from our, the naked eye. And um, in ECG case 1, we couldn't really find any PVCs, and in ECG case 2, we found seven PVCs, and which are essentially characterized by these lower dips in the graph, and these three uh, PVCs that occur consecutively, we characterized as a single VT. And these observations were noted down over here. In task 2, we were supposed to filter the ECG case 1 signal, and, and bring it in a form similar to ECG case 2, uh, the signal of ECG case 2, that is. Um, so in order to do that, we subtracted the offset values and removed any frequencies greater than 50 hertz or less than 0 0.5 hertz using Fourier transforms, and we plotted the filter signal over here. Um, to find the average heart rate, we essentially apply the find peaks function, which would mark all of the R peaks and the number of RPs we could directly attribute to the to the same number of heart beats that occurred in that time interval. So we would simply use uh, use that to find the heart uh, the heart rate in BPM. And then to find the heart rate variation, we used um, the consecutive R peaks and the time interval in between them and characterized it characterized it with having a single heartbeat occur in that specific time interval. Then we correct, uh, essentially calculated heart, uh, separate heartbeats uh, between separate consecutive, uh, separate pairs of uh, R peaks, and thus uh, we could relate the heart rate very heart rate uh, to time, uh, which was essentially which we plotted over here and labeled it as heart rate variation with time. Um, at 9.3 seconds, it is obvious to see that there, there is a significant dip in the heart rate of about 51.5 BPM. So the average heart rate came out to be 69 BPM too. In task 3 and task 4, we were supposed to label the RST waves of both ECG case 1 and case 2 signals. In case 1, the, the task was very simple because the signal is regular. Um, we already have calculated the R peaks in the previous in the previous task to find the respective T peaks. Uh, what we did was essentially get rid of the R peaks uh, by first um, using a temporary array, and then um, we removed uh, the values of the amplitude around a very small time interval around the R peaks. So now that when we would apply the find peaks function again, it would mark the T peaks. So for the S peaks, which are essentially minimums that occur within 0.4 seconds of an R peak, we use the same iterative signal and we reverse the polarity of it. So now the so now the minimums will become maximums. That is, the S peak will become a maximum, and we will apply the find peaks function again, and it will mark the S peaks now instead. And th and this is what we plotted over here. In task four, um, we had to alter the the algorithm was pretty much the same, but we had to alter the implementation of it because there is uh, there are fairly uh, this is a fairly irregular signal uh, in, the, in ECG case two. So if you apply um, the find peaks function naively, uh, for at first we essentially get all of the R peaks and these abnormal T peaks as well, which have which essentially have abnormally high amplitudes as compared to their R peaks. So um, uh, to separate out specifically the R peaks and get remove these T peaks so that we can then use the R peaks as a reference point to find the S and T peaks, we um, I use the fact we use the fact that um, the R peaks occur before the T peaks. So whenever I found uh, so first of all we can see that any uh, peak that has an amplitude of over 250 uh, we characterize that as as implemented in this conditional over here we characterize it as an R wave. And any peaks that I found, which which had amplitudes of less than 250, would either be 250 would either be an R an R wave or an or an abnormal T wave. So I use the fact I use this dummy variable over here, which incremented every time I found such a peak with an amplitude of less than 250. And so whenever dumb was odd, I could characterize the peak I was at as an R peak. 
because R peaks occur before T peaks. Then using that them as reference points, I found the um, the respective T and the S peaks using the fact that T peaks were essentially maximums that occur between two R bits, and uh, what and the S peaks were essentially minimums that occurred between either um, 0 0.4 seconds after and the R the current R bit we were on, or between two consecutive R bits. Because uh, in case of in case uh, of the possibility that the R wave actually occurred within 0 0.4 seconds of the uh, current R wave we were at. So that's how we that's how we found the RST compasses for case two when we plotted it. In task five, uh, what I first did, which could be argued to be a little obsolete in these cases, but I wanted to generalize it with, uh, into all ECG signals where. For example, the signal did not start with a complete RST complex or did not end with a complete RST complex because my algorithm essentially uh, uh, depends on upon the fact that the number of R peaks, R peaks, S peaks, and T peaks are the same. So um, whenever the signal didn't start from within an R wave, for example, if it started with a t if, an, if it started with an S wave, I added a dummy R wave, uh, R peak, um, so as to complete the RST complex, and I did keep track of the num any dummy R peaks I added so as to not include them in um, future uh, in, in the future algorithm when calculating for PVCs uh, in this variable over here. Uh, so these two entries consist of the number of R, R any dummy R peaks I added in both of in case one and case two signals. And if the T P if the signal start of the T peak I could just simply get rid of the T P because the T peak alone couldn't possibly um, give rise to a PVC, so I could simply ignore it. And if, uh, if at the end uh, the if a signal ended at an R or an S peak, I could essentially get rid of both of them because the R because without a T peak, the R and S peaks cannot possibly um, contribute to a PVC. S uh, so afterwards, this is my main algorithm for checking for PVCs and VTs, which essentially uses booleans. Um, so first of all, I combine all of the indices for all of the peaks in both of those signals in a single array, so as to shorten my code length, and combine the T peak uh, amplitudes as well. Uh, so this for loop essentially goes through all of the signals using booleans like no arrhythmia to keep track of whether there is an arrhythmia or not, short or or long ST, high T to keep track of the characteristics of a PVC, consecutive to keep track of how many consecutive PVCs I've gone through. And the PVC, the essentially, essentially the for loop essentially just goes through and checks for all the characteristics: uh, long ST interval, high T interval, high T amplitude, or short R intervals. And if at any point I have any two of these conditions to be true, I could I could um, characterize the RST complex I was at as a PVC, and change the boolean value boolean values uh, accordingly. So if I, and then if, if at any point I had consecutive equals to three, I could characterize the comp the three complexes that uh, occurred before uh, all together to consist for uh, consist of a VT. And if at the end of it all, uh, no arrhythmia, the boolean value of no arrhythmia was true, I could display that there was no arrhythmia in the signal. And um, my results over here, as you can see. As you can see, for ECG case one, there was no arrhythmia detected. There were seven PVCs detected for ECG case two, and a VT detected in ECG case two as well. They were all of their respective time intervals. Thank you.